Tell me what you've learned so far. Oh, this is always a scary question that teacher has. What did you learn so far? Nothing. Uh, tell, me what, tell me what you have absorbed so, thus far when it comes to the, uh, the inductive Bible study. Oh, uh, man. Budget. Studying takes time, like a lot more time than when you just read it. Yes, very good. It begins with prayer. Okay, good. Keyword recognition. Okay, good. What else? Time, prayer, recognition. I pay more attention to who now. All right. And where. And yeah. Where they are. Excellent. I did so, what, where, when, so the when, whole observation. I, I, did not, I did not before. Not awesome. <laughs> good, good. An observation is uh, what? What step? First. Very first step in this whole process, right? All right, good. What else are you guys taking away? It's been, what, two classes now? Yeah. What else have you taken away when it comes to studying the Word? Without actually studying, just, just looking at, like when we were talking last week about how many times you use certain words. If you go through and you just write down the main words, you get a good feel for what he's talking about without even reading sentences. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. You get a sense of peace, I think, when you read when you're studying. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is all good stuff. What else? I have enjoyed uh, contrasts and comparisons. I found they were okay. so much in, in that way. Good. Excellent. Anything else? Tell me, tell me your, how your um, perception, maybe even your method of Bible study has been challenged in the last two weeks. As, as we've had a lot of discussion, what, what's, what's really challenged you in your personal study? What are you realizing? What are you learning? History really makes, makes a difference. History makes a big difference. And, and again, that, that whole idea, sorry, this marker is really dying. Uh, going from the biblical world, and here's our challenge, how do you bridge that ladder and go into our world now? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well said, brother. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's in this process right here, in this process right here, that translation, interpretation, all of that becomes so vital. And, and, and we gave some, some examples of, you know, if you don't understand what's happening in the biblical world, the culture, the context, and you try to take that world and just plant it in our culture, you're going to run into problems. Here's, here's the issue, though. When you open up God's word, the books don't start by explaining what's going on culturally. It just starts giving you truth because it was written in that culture. You pick up the local newspaper, the article is not going to start by explaining American culture unless it's, it's on American culture. You understand what I'm saying? It's just going to, that editor of the New York Times or whatever paper, he is going to write from the perspective that you understand the American culture. So there's going to be lingo used, maybe phrases, maybe slang, whatever, and he's not going to explain it to you. You're going to already know. Okay? If you picked up any article, any type of newspaper or magazine and read this phrase, raise your hand if you do not know what it means, Obamacare. See? You hand that to somebody in India. Well, they may even know. <laughs> Side note. <laughs> when we were in China, did I tell you this story? When we talked about China? I think I, I, I thought I said it. We were in China. Doug and I are, you know, 10 days we were cooped up, you know, teaching these underground pastors. The so last day, the guy says, you know, we're going to get you guys out, get you some fresh air. So we're going to take you down to down, downtown um, Quendo or Quendao, I forget how to pronounce it. He said, well, just stay right in this area. And then he had to go and do some business. And I'm thinking, <laughs> dude, you just left us out. So Doug and I are walking. We're right on the coastline there and uh, beautiful. And all of a sudden, this guy walks up to us and says, 
you guys are Americans. We're like, yeah, what gave it away? <laughs> so he starts yapping with us. And he's like, hi, you know, I'm from Florida. You know, I lived in Florida 20 years. Then he starts railing on Obamacare. I kid you not. I looked at Doug and said, you got to be kidding me. So anyway, so that guy in China is probably the only guy in China that knew about it. But, but context, 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 context is so important when it comes to translating what, what is the truth that God has given. Because there, there is one truth that was given, that God gave as he inspired his word, and these men wrote down the truth. Does that truth change when we come over to our world? Yes or no? No. No? Not if it's a truth. Yes? Uh-oh, this is good. Okay. Come on, brother. You say yes? What do you mean? Explain. Elaborate on that. Oh, come on, man. You can't just say yes without elaborating. You feel the truth does change? The, the truth does change, yes. Okay. And, and, and who feels the truth does not change? Okay. Why do you say it does not change from, from this culture to this culture? You say it does. Okay. Can you give me an example? Think of them. I'm going to think of one. Think about an example. Okay. God's not speaking to the culture. Ah. He's speaking to the person. Okay. God's speaking to the person. Okay, so, so you're saying, therefore, whatever he said is the truth of what he said. Culture, this truth is not bound by culture. Is that what you're saying, essentially, George? Okay, all right. Who else? Somebody else was going to say a comment. Go ahead. Well, truth is truth itself, That's right? It. It's, it, it, it just is. Right. What is true is true. It doesn't really matter. Thank you. Okay, thanks. It stands against culture. All right, let me ask you a question. And everything else. One plus one in the biblical world equals two. How about in this world? Does it still equal two? Did the truth change? Okay. Truth doesn't change. If something is true by its very definition... then can it change? This is a big issue. And this is part of why we have so many different denominations. <laughs> and we have different takes on the word of God. For example, I talked to someone in my family who's, uh, we got in a conversation, it was Thanksgiving, and you know, one of those conversations turns religious, you know, and some family members are Christians, some aren't. And all of a sudden, uh, my, uh, sister pipes up and I hear her over here talking there's a lot of people there and, and I'm kind of catching what she's saying oh no yeah no but that's not what the Bible means anymore and I'll, you know and, and I'm trying to like stay in my conversation and then I'm like <laughs> so I just casually walk in and just hear what they're talking about and, and, and here's you know they were engaged in this conversation when Jesus Christ said I am the truth and uh, no man comes unto the Father except, right? What did he mean? And I'm going to paraphrase her answer. Well, what he meant for his time, for his people. But now today, there's many, many different people that God sends into our lives that can become our messiahs. Ooh. Ooh. You're like... You know, and so, and these people are engaged with her, and, and, and I don't even know their affiliation, spiritually, whatever, but they say, oh, okay. And, and for my sister, she's adapted this form of uh, spiritualism, Indian spirit worship. She, she's into that, real big. Incense, the ancestors, invoking the spirits of the ancestors, and that's her guiding light. And she said, but for the Jewish people, it was Jesus Christ. And each of us have to find who is that one that through them we find light and life and eternity. Doesn't that sound like nice and fluffy and good? Like something you can put your hand around? Here's the problem. 
if Jesus Christ is not the way, the truth, and the light, as he said he was, then he was a liar. Either he is or he isn't. Truth, or something is true, it doesn't change. What does change between here and here? The way we interpret and apply it. The way we interpret it? And apply it. Isn't that now... Either it's true or it's not. What was the second word you said? Apply it. Ah. Is the application going to change? Mm-hmm. Can you give me an example? Give me an example. We talked about the cloth, the women in the prayer clause. Okay. <clears throat> some, pe- some believe that women aren't allowed to speak in church either. Yeah. Okay. I came from that. So yeah. there's, that's, that, that's how some of them would interpret that also. And some would even go as far as to say as a woman ought, or, or, or a man ought not to work for a woman employer. I think that gets into that arguing ground of is like the, the head coverings, was that a truth? It's something that was true in the, in the day, mm. the same way you could say it was true more people spoke Aramaic than English. That was true. And the fact that they wore those headpieces isn't, it, it's a true state. But it gets into that why were they wearing them? There you Who go. Commanded there them? you go. Okay. Is it true that Jesus Christ said that there is forgiveness of sins by him shedding his blood? Is that true? No. Yeah. Yes. Is it true? that God said in the Old Testament, take a lamb to the priest for the forgiveness of sins. Mm-hmm. True. But which is it? Wait, who, did you say? God, command the Israelites to bring a sin offering to the priest that your sins may be forgiven. Mm-hmm. Is that true? Did God say that in the Old Testament? Then why aren't we doing that today? Because why are Oh, so truth does change. <coughs> More truth came after the truth. That truth, no. (laughs) The difference between something that's true and something that's a truth. It was true back then when he said, take a lamb to the priest as a sacrifice. That's true. It never became untrue. But something new came along. Uh, You drive, what do you drive? Me, a 93 Buick Skylark. If I write right now, Ron (laughs) Jones, teacher of some... (laughs) <laughs> the drives of the U.S. Skylark and I wrote that Is that true? sealed it and stamped it and in 10 years somebody reads that and it's like he's driving a, he's driving a Mercedes and preach it brother prophesy man <laughs> prophesy. I, I received that prophecy on my life <laughs> see I still got a little Pentecostal in me <laughs> I pull it out when it benefits no, that, that's a great example. That's a great example. Validate what you right. It was true in that what? Context and in that culture. Go ahead. Well, didn't they, uh, it started off of the sacrifice for an individual, then there was a family, and the blood from Jesus Christ is for, mm-hmm. for all. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it graduated to that. So God began to give more revelation, Right. But what he said in the Old Testament, as Rick pointed, yeah, it was true. Absolutely. So it's not that truth has changed. The truth is there still needs to be a payment for sin. Now with the New Testament, Christ says, what? It is now me. I'm your high priest. That's a great analogy with the car. Don't forget that analogy. That's a good analogy. Wasn't the sacrifices in the Old Testament for a covering of their sin, not of forgiveness. Ah, uh, which was it? Covering. It was a covering. Year. What's the difference? Oh, it it didn't take from care of it. It didn't wipe it out. It was, uh, I believe it was something that was going to lead up to was to come. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which is Christ. So they responded and revealed truth that God had given, exercised that, and then Christ comes, and it's like the cross goes back. And their sins are forgiven based on what then? The people in the Old Testament, their sins are forgiven, and they will stand justified in front of a holy God based on what? The lamb sacrifices? But what ultimately 
They believe God. Jesus. They believe God. Yeah, who said it? Jesus. The blood of Christ is the only payment God is accepting. So you're absolutely right. And you read Hebrews and you see that, where he says, there is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. And then he goes and he talks about the giving of the lamb, that that could not forgive sins. So even though God had given that and said, do this, there was a, a fuller purpose. Okay? It, it makes sense? All to make the point, what is the context of this book that I'm reading, and where am I when, when you take Genesis to the book of Revelation, which, the, which is the culmination of everything, where am I at in these different books? Because remember, is this one book? No. How many? 66 different books with different genres or types of literature. Got to remember that. So what type of literature am I in? Am I in the historical? We'll talk more about this later. Am I in... The poetic portion of scripture? Am I in the prayer or the Psalms? Uh, the letters of scripture, like the epistles? Am I in eschatology, future things? What type of literature am I in? That, that is huge before you start interpreting. And that's where we use this, the Sunday newspaper with all the different sections. You know, I'm not going to go to the comic section to get health information. And I'm reading the comics about them joking about their health and their remedies. I'm not going to take that to heart if I really got a health problem. Why? Because of the type of literature it is. It's entertainment. It's comics. I'm going to go to the medical section if I'm serious about learning something about health. Does that make sense? You've got to understand this is a collection of books. And that's where a lot of times not understanding what type of book we're in, it throws us in a loop when we start reading something like, what in the world are they talking about? Look at this weird stuff they're doing in scripture. Well, you're reading historical narrative of, of, of what happened during that time. Okay? We'll talk more about that when we get into the interpretation side. Okay? Uh, so this is good. So, so, so you're getting a lot out of it. That's good. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, I gave you chapter 2, correct? To look at chapter 2... And to take it through step one, which is what? Observation. Plaster the text with questions. Right? A lot of things you said, you know, the five W's, who, what, where, why, when, how. Uh, contrast and comparison. All right? Um, let me get this off the board. And, and on chapter two, for you guys who are able to do that, just kind of throw at me. Some of your observations. Philippians chapter 2. Just, just throw out your observations that you made in chapter 2. He's talking about working together, having a common purpose. Okay. He talks common purpose. Good. And then give me the verse that you're getting this from. Oh, if, well, if you don't already have it marked down, that's okay. Don't, don't worry about it. But if you have the verse... Where, where you're getting this observation, throw that out to me too, please. All right, somebody else. Just, just throw them out. Observations from chapter 2. What did you observe in chapter 2? There's many more negative keywords in chapter 2. Many more negative keywords. Very interesting. <coughs> more negatives. Good. All right, keep it going. What else? I thought um, Jordan served yes. Christ. In the uh, unity of the spirit. Um, okay. This is interesting. The mind that it was supposed to be. Mind, mind and spirit. Mind and spirit, okay. So, unity, mind. This, these themes are starting to come up. Okay, what else? Humility. Humility. Okay. What else? Compassion. Right. Compassion. All right. Keep it going. No complaining or disputing. Okay. He's he's what? Commanding that or <clears throat> uh, exhorting it, I guess. Ex okay. So so he addresses the issue of complaining. Okay. 
Obedience. 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 Good. <coughs> okay. I'm Christ sorry. Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness. He talks about. Oh, a contentment with being closer to God. Yeah. That's that's huge right there. Contentment. <laughs> okay. Now, this is a big one. Let me just stop here for a minute. Let's say somebody comes in the office and they're struggling with life. They're struggling with trying to find purpose in life. And I just did the observation like you guys just did. Is this a good place to take somebody and talk about contentment? And show them, what, why not? Because that's why they're there. They're not content, right? Okay. Brother DeWitt, why did you say no? Because they're not there in, until, you, until you work through all the other problems, you can't get to contentment. Okay. You have to get to the root of the problem. Absolutely. See? How would I know not to take them here because I've taken my personal study through what you guys are doing? Does that make sense? When you do the observation stage, there is so much information you can gather on the surface. Just what is this book about? So when people, and this is just the first step, observation. Then we're going to go to interpretation. Then we're going to go to application. We're still on observation. So that when somebody comes in the office for counseling, why do we call it biblical counseling? We're going to a book in the Bible that addresses where you are. Okay? Make sense? All right. Let's keep going. Any more observations that you guys have? Servant. Servant. Good. All right. What else you got? Innocently. I'm sorry? Innocently. Innocently. Okay. What, what, what are you making reference to there, Rick? Um, let me find the verse. Something without complaint is innocent. Okay. So it, it's tied to the whole complaining thing. Is it tied to that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, verse 14, probably, you're talking about. Do all things without grumbling or questioning that you may be blameless and innocent. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Let me ask you this. If you had to say, what is chapter 2 about? How would you summarize what chapter 2, without looking at your headings in your Bible? <laughs> oh, um, Paul writing that we are lights in the world. That's kind of what I got out of it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which is why I recommend, you know, don't, don't, I mean, that's fine. But don't, don't go on that. Go on what you got out of it. What, what would you say as you read chapter 2? What is chapter 2 about? What, what's Paul getting at? You think character? Okay. Rick? Similar attitude. Attitude? Good. Anybody else? Just what, what was your impression? Chapter 2. His, his understanding of how the church is right now. I mean, the words he's hearing back while he's in jail. I guess, what could you call it? Um, he, under, he sympathizes with them because he understands what they're going through at the moment. Okay. So, so it's almost like there's, there's an understanding. He's informed of their. Right. Okay. He's very informed. Okay. So he understands where they are positionally, what, what's going on right now. He's been in prison for two or three years. Okay, good. What else? Chapter 2 is about what? The care of others. Okay. Care of others. Good. What Before else? For yourself. Right. Okay. Humility. Humility. Good. Any other themes? Compassion. Compassion. Now, Christ likeness. Christ likeness, huge. And and you'll see this being a, a big theme of the Apostle Paul, mentioning this all throughout his writings. Look at all this information that you're getting just from just read it and just tell me what you see. <laughs> just observation. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Good. 
Excellent. Do you see how important this first step is, guys? It's, it's full of information. Oftentimes, when we go to read our word, and again, th this is why, and, 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 and please, don't take this, you know, don't take this personal, but, you know, I jest a lot about when people tell me how they, you know, do their Bible study. The guy I told you that was proud that he was reading five chapters a day. Okay, that's, that's great. And, and, and if you do that every morning, okay. Let me ask you a question. You guys read chapter two and pulled these observations out. How long did that take you? I had to read chapter two five times. <laughs> yeah. but, but you're right. And, 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 and that's, that's going, you're going to get more out of God's word by slowing down, stop, and observe. I can't, I can't read five chapters and, and suck all this out. There's no way you can do that. So what's going to happen? You're going to read through and certain words are going to jump out at you, right? Like, oh, wow, okay. Oh, wow, that's neat. Oh, wow, by the time you get through five chapters. Now, is that a bad thing? No. But do you have the whole picture? I guarantee you, you don't. Um, I think it's a good idea, though, to uh, take a... Uh, um, like a bird's eye view. Absolutely, yes. Of like even the, the whole chapter or the whole book. Yep, yeah, absolutely. So you right. have the idea. And yes. Then, you know. Absolutely, and 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 we're going to talk about that because that's part of this step. Ideally, what you want to do, okay, I'm going to study the book of Philippians. You're going to read through the whole letter because remember, this was not a book that was written in four chapters. It was one letter. The editors put in chapters and verses so we could find things. But this would have been one letter in one scroll. So if that's the way Paul wrote it, then we ought to read it that way. So the idea is when, when you're doing your observation step, and, and this is why it takes time. The very first thing I'm going to do when I start a book study, very first thing, number one, I'm going to read through, and he says this somewhere in the notes. I'm going to read through the book. And somebody said, five, who said five times? I did. Yeah, very good. Uh, you know, five times, three times, two, the point is, read through the entire book. Here's what I try to do. Let's say I'm going to start a study on the book of Philippians. I'm going to read through, at least in that sitting, one whole time. Then go back to chapter 1 and just read chapter 1 and do what you guys have just done. Okay? Tomorrow when I come back, what am I going to do? If, if I read, go into my study the next day and, and study, I'm going to read chapters 1 to 4 and then go to chapter 2 and pull up my observations. The next day, I'm going to read chapters 1 to 4 and go to chapter 3. Do you see what's going on here? I'm going to tell you what. If, if, if you discipline yourself to study God's word that way, and remember, we're on step one. You are going to know and be able to handle what the book of Philippians says. You're going to know. It is amazing. Repetition, repetition. Then I get to chapter four. That morning I read all four chapters. And, and, and here's what you'll find. By the time you, you start reading through that fourth time, it's almost like you anticipate what's coming. Because you've read it so much. Okay? Now I did my observations on chapter four. Guess what? Next day I come back to do my study, what am I going to do? Read the whole book. I'm going to read the whole book again. Now I'm back in chapter one doing step two, interpretation. Next day, read the whole book. Now I'm in chapter two, interpretation. You take each one of those steps, observation, interpretation, application, by constantly going back and forth. Now that takes discipline, but guys, that's not above any of us in this room. We all can do that. How do I know that? How many people? <laughs> you know what I'm going to say, right? Well, Go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. What am no, I going to say? I just know because you, that's how you are. What? <laughs> pick on yourself. Huh? Are you going to pick on yourself? No. Okay. I'm just gonna... okay. He's going to pick on us. No, I was going to pick on us. Yeah, I know you will, Rick. Thank you. Uh, okay, that works. That's great for Philippians, but yeah. there's some Genesis. beefier. Yeah. Yes, there are. Like Genesis. I'm not going to read all. How many chapters in Genesis? 20, 30? No, you're absolutely right. That's where I'm going to take it in sections. Great point. 
th this what this works this concept you can apply to any book but yes you may have to take smaller chunks absolutely great point okay um, is anybody in here an avid reader of any periodicals that that you subscribe to magazines newspapers anything we only read the bible okay <laughs> All right, brother. Oh, to be like you one day. I open a religious I just get Israel my glory. Okay. Um, uh, you just shot my example out the I'm water. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. Nobody reads newspapers anymore. What 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 I wanted you to say is like they you know these muscle car magazines. Some car driver. You get those, right? Tool magazines, right? Uh, years ago, I, I, I used to get, um, it wasn't Muscle Fitness, it was one of those health magazines. Every time it came, what do you think I did methodically? You know, <laughs> you know I'm going to give you your grade now for the class. Okay. What, what did I methodically <laughs> What did I do, brother? You know what? You opened it up, leaf throat. <laughs> and you know what? Did I read every single thing in that magazine? What do you think? No. But I'm going to tell you what, by the time I got done with that magazine, by the time the next one came the next month, that thing was so ratty, pages were falling out. Because you sit down again, hey, what's up, honey? How you doing? How was your day? And you pick up the same magazine, and what do you do? Same page. And all of a sudden, you focus on this article that you didn't read the last time. That's the idea here. Okay? Guys, there is so much that you can get out of just doing that. Okay? Now, um, let's turn to the notes here. Because Pastor Rice here, he, he breaks it down kind of the same. And again, th th there's no magical formula here. But what, the reason I gave you this, because I like what he says about these first three important facts, the context, the historical background, and again, this is where you're going to have to use some tools, and then he talks about the importance of language, okay? So let's take a look here on page one, context. Please tell me you have all the right pages. Everybody's looking like, where are you? Yes? The, okay. The context is vital to ensure the original intent, and there's the key, and purpose of the writer of the day it was written. That the original intent and the purpose. So when, when in, the, in the Bible context, the Bible world, when Moses wrote something, did Moses have an intent in what he said? Absolutely. Okay? And it's important that we understand the context in which he said it. Okay? That does not change as far as the intent. So look at letter A. Today many teachers and preachers do violence to the scriptures. They come up with some of the most erroneous interpretations because they have ignored this basic principle of context. Context, context is at the heart of a good interpretation or a bad one. Okay? Heard a minister on Sunday preaching this way. He went and he began to read the Old Testament prophet that was prophesying to Israel and, and, and telling Israel how Jehovah was going to bless them. I've called you out to be my own people. I've called you out to be a nation. I will bless you. I will take you into the land flowing with milk and honey, right? Now, in the context, who's the prophet talking to? The nation of Israel. He took that out of the context and then preached to his congregation and said, God says to you today, I have called you. God wants to bring you into a land of milk and honey. God wants to prosper your soul. And I'm sitting there thinking, no, sorry, that's not what, no, nope, you just took it out of context. He was talking to the nation of Israel. He wasn't talking to me. That happens all the time. So things that the prophet specifically said to a specific people, preachers will pull out and then make it applicable to us. That's violating the context. 
Make sense? Okay. So look at number two. The result is that they destroy the original intent and meaning of the text. They interpret it subjectively. They interpret it by spiritualizing it. And I shared that last week with you where I took a passage and totally spiritualized it. It had nothing to do with the context. Look at letter B. Text out of its context is nothing but a pretext. Okay? It has no authority when you pull it out of its original context. Uh, this happens in communication all the time, right? You ever talk to someone and you say, man, you're taking what I said out of context. People do it all the time with the Bible. Now, why do they do that? Well, here's why. Look at number one. There are various types of sermons such as biographical, textual, topical, and propositional. And I'm not going to go into all of that for, for, for our case here. But number two, but there is only one way to do inductive study, which will prepare the expositor for his sermon material, whatever type is chosen. This is the first area of inductive method. In other words, what is he saying? Listen, there's all kinds of different messages. Some preachers like topical, some people. Uh, the bottom line is you can't get away from the method of how to study the Bible. You can't go in there and just... Here's what happens. A lot of times you hear a church will do a, 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 a uh, topical series. We're going to preach nine weeks on how to be a leader. And then they'll go through scripture, picking out various books and various verses that appear to be talking about leadership. Anything wrong with that? Sure, you don't know what's going on around that passage. Okay, what's going on around the passage? Now, and then again, a lot of those passages are not heretical. It's not like they're saying something that we wouldn't agree with. It's just not in that passage. <laughs> you're, you're taking a topic that God does talk about, but, but, but you're taking a passage and saying this passage justifies and is teaching us how to be a leader. And I say, well, well wait a minute, where did you get that? Well, that, that's in the context of Moses arguing with somebody. What does it have to do with leadership? It is easy to go in and take verses out, and you can string them together and, and come up with all kinds of topics. You don't want to do that when you study the Word of God, because it would be like me walking into your conversation, taking one or two sentences out of what you two are saying, and I go here and build a whole case on something that you never even said. Make sense? Okay? All right, so um, let's move on. Context. I'm gonna, you're going to hear me just beat that word to death. Historical background. The historical background is also very important to ensure that what is being taught or required is relevant to our day. And that's what we kind of talked about in the beginning here. What do we bring over from the Old Testament? What do we bring over from the New Testament into our world? Is it applicable today? Right? Well, how are you going to know? Taking it through the inductive Bible study method so you can come out, okay, this is the truth that he was preaching. What does that look like today? The truth doesn't change, but what's the application of this now? Like we talked about the lambs. We're not offering lambs anymore for our sins, okay? That's a big one, and, and again, we'll, we'll develop these more. Letter A, a good example would be the command to the women to wear veils to honor their husbands at Corinth. We kind of talked about that the last time. The city had a temple to Aphrodite, and the temple prostitutes would be unveiled, showing that they had no covering over their lives. In other words, no husband, and were in fact temple prostitutes. You can't get away from that historically. That's what was going on in the culture. Does that have any implication on why Paul said what he said about veils? Absolutely. You can't rip him out from the culture and say he was talking about something else. See? Well, then how do you bring that over into our time if we don't have the same cultural issues? And there's tons of scriptures that have tremendous implications on how you interpret them if you don't understand the historical background. Okay? Make sense? Um, let's go on. If you have any questions, please just stop me or comments. Don't feel like you can't, all right? I know Rick will if he wants to. Number two, the command of Paul to the women is to not use their liberty in Christ lest two things take place. They be mistaken for temple prostitutes and dishonor their husbands by identifying with the permissive women of the city. This is what was going on and why Paul said what he said. 
This is what we might call cultural relativity. The literal command is not obligated, nor does it apply to our present day. Why? We don't usually have a situation where prostitutes are walking around. The temple. The temple, yeah. But what would apply? What's the truth that we carry over to our day? Honor the marriage. Okay. Maybe how a woman dresses, really. If you go to Las Vegas. <clears throat> An issue of modesty comes into play, doesn't it? Right. At, at the heart of what he's saying here, is this not an issue of modesty? Don't dress the way the prostitutes dress. Now, in their culture, it was the whole veil thing. <laughs> See, that's totally removed from our, I, I wish that was just the issue in our day, just a veil or not. That'd be awesome. But it's people not dressing. <laughs> you see? So, so the truth is still for our time that women ought to carry themselves in a way that is honorable to their husbands and should not be dressing like a prostitute. You mean with the veil? No. How do prostitutes dress in 2012? Don't do it. <laughs> See how you just carry the same truth over? This is going to be more than a veil issue. <laughs> you follow me, guys? Okay. So let's go on. The next point there, but we can apply the principle of honoring and obeying husbands as the heads of the homes and glorifying God in one's conduct by staying away from all appearance of evil. So there you bring the truth over any implication of what the Apostle Paul was saying. Number three, the Bible transcends the culture regarding morals and ethics, not the reverse. That's important. And, and that, again, our conversation in the beginning, truth is truth. God doesn't change his mind when it comes to the truth. He's not on some sliding scale of morality. I heard a sermon on uh, this <clears throat> topic uh, about woman's purity. Mm -hmm. And the preacher said something I thought was really a good analogy. He said, you don't advertise what's not for sale. That's, that's so the analogy. If a woman's... And men, men, it goes for men also. If, if you uh, dress in a way that's modest, people can, you know, can tell. Right. Absolutely. And then they know what kind of person you really are. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people, I mean, the way they dress today, it's unbelievable. No shame or anything. Mm -hmm. You know, my wife said... My, yeah, exactly. My wife's biggest pet peeve with women clothes. Maybe some of you women have the same one. Huh? No <laughs> She says, and again, she says this out of frustration. You know, the world is designing all the women's clothes. So that's why I look the way they look. We need some Christian women designers. And she gets so frustrated when she goes into store after store after store trying to find something that's modest. And the world don't care about that. You know, and I say, well, honey, there you go. You know, go out the sewing machine. Go ahead. You know. But there is, there, I mean, there is clothes that are modest. Well, yeah, I know. I know. But, yeah, yeah, you got to really look. You know, that, that shelf way in the back. <laughs> you got to look real. Right. Exactly. You have to look hard. Today. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, under under uh, letter or number three. If the Bible teaches sexual purity, it is an absolute for all ages. If the Bible teaches lying is wrong, it's for all ages. Okay? Doesn't change the truth because the culture changes. <coughs> Letter B. We must be careful not to compromise or substitute the word of God for human teachings in order to justify or rationalize a sinful lifestyle. And again, you can go down the list here, psychology, anthropology, sociology, situational ethics. I mean, you know, how many times have you heard, well, the Bible, that is such an archaic book. And that was written under a very male-dominated society. 
And, and come on, guys, it's 2012. Get with it. Do you really believe that stuff in there? Right? That's, that's the mindset of the world when it comes to the Word of God. That's the mindset that my sister has. And obviously, she knows my stance. I believe this is the inerrant Word of God, period. And then when she starts pointing out different things, not understanding the types of literature, the context, and the purpose of books, yeah, you can make this out to seem like a crazy book. Absolutely. Right? So. Yes. Uh, number six, by any other humanistic teaching that contradicts or opposes the word of God, trying to justify, uh, I'm sorry, trying to justify, I think should, that should be justified, or your uh, culp culpability of a sinful lifestyle. In other words, come up with your own way of teaching, some new philosophy you have, and if it contradicts this, the bottom line is you're just trying to justify what you want to do because there's probably something in here that says you're not to do it. That happens all the time in our culture. Okay? Um, so, he points out those three things that are very important. The third one here, language, very important. And don't let this scare you, okay? The original language is key to understand the meaning as well as the sense of the sentence, be it Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. And that's where people are like, oh, hey, I don't know those languages. Okay, it's okay. There's study tools out for that. Word studies must be done not in isolation, but in conjunction with the passage. Context and the relation to the other words that structure the sentence or section. Lest the wrong meaning is given to a word because the same word can be used in different ways. Make sense? What does this sentence mean? The counter was painted red. What does that mean? Painted red. Okay. What is this? It's a counter. Could be a counter. Can you give me can you give me a definition of the word counter? Tabletop. Tabletop? Person. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a per kitchen counter? <laughs> it's a counter. Okay. Okay. counter. Okay, so it could be you, you agree it could be a person? Mm -hmm. it could be a Somebody standing at the door, counting the money? A booth taker guy? It could be a tabletop? A machine that counts money. It could be a machine that counts money, referred to as a counter. What else could it be? You ever see one of these things? I forget what you call them. The little beads on them? And you move them? Abacus. Yeah, that thing. <laughs> when I taught kindergarten, we refer to that as a counter. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. What am I talking about? Which one of these am I talking about was painted red? No way to know. You don't know because what? Not enough information. Could be all of them, not enough information. You need more information. This is why you can't take one verse and say, this is what the verses mean. No, no, no. Put that verse back in its context. What do the other verses mean? So if you continue to read, the counter was painted red. Bobby was totally opposed to this. The counter was painted red. Bobby was totally opposed to this. Now which one do you think I'm talking about? Person. Sounds like, might be. Bobby's a person, but you don't know if he's the counter. Might be a person. Yeah, Bobby's opposed to being painted red, maybe? <laughs> That's what it sounds like. Bobby was totally opposed to this. Or Bobby's wife said, let's paint the countertop red. Maybe the wife wants to paint it red, a countertop, and Bobby doesn't want to do that. You still don't have enough information. <laughs> the counter was painted red. Bobby was totally adamant against this. Martha, his cousin, said everyone is painting theirs red. <laughs> Still, not Still not enough information. It could be their countertop. It could be the machine that they have at their base. It, or it could be this, what is this thing called? Abacus. That thing. Abacus. Right? Finally, Bobby's wife said, 
I paid for the kitchen renovation. I'm painting it red. What are we talking about? Yeah. Probably talking about a countertop. Guys, this is what we do with scripture. You have to look at the meaning of the word in its given context. And again, we <laughs> talked about this in, in the original language. Greek words had many different meanings. Problem is, when they translate the Greek into English in your English Bibles, you have this many options for Greek, this many options for English. See a problem? Like the word love. How is love translated in English from Greek? Love. love. <laughs> Look up the English meaning of love, and it'll miss out on three other aspects of the Greek meaning of love. But the only word we got for love in English is love. <laughs> you, you see how that can create a problem? So you say, well, 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 what do I do? How do I know that English word really means what it means? This is why we have so many different translations. We talked about that a little bit. Why, why are these English translations coming out every year? The scholars are seeking to try to get closer and closer and closer to an English word that fits the Greek word. So for example, in some of the older translations, Paul writes in Ephesians and he says this, only let your conversation be that which is worthy of the gospel. What's he talking about? Only let your conversation be that which is worthy of the gospel. Your talk. Your lifestyle. Your life. Talk or lifestyle. Which is it? It's lifestyle. It comes from a Greek word that means lifestyle. It's not talking about your... Now you can say, well, but your lifestyle includes your talk. Oh, okay. I'm not going to split hairs over that. But you see the point. How about Philippians? Turn to Philippians. Uh, look at, uh, somebody read their chapter of, chapter 1, verse 8, please. And, and some of your translations will probably have different words, but I want to try to make a point. Hopefully somebody has translation that has this word in it. Philippians 1, 8. Somebody read that, please. The God is my witness, <coughs> how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. All right, anybody have something different? God, God is my record. <clears throat> okay, anybody have anything different? God can testify. Okay, good. How I yearn. How I yearn for you. Okay, anybody have anything else? Anything different than those? How I long for you. All of you. All of you, okay. Because of Jesus Christ. Say, read yours. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. In the bowels? In the bowels of Jesus Christ? What? Prime example. And I have affection. <laughs> That's what it means in the Greek. You see why we have different translations? And I guarantee you, without even looking, that's probably a King James Bible. Because this is the old English word that meant inner affection. So the translators see that and say, wow, you know what? It's 2012. We don't talk that way anymore. Man, I just have bowels for you. <laughs> you know, how would that go over? You'd be like, yo, dude, you need to go use the bathroom. See? This is why we have different English translations. So he said, what's a better word? Well, let's look back at that Greek word. The Greek word means affection. And in 1611, bowels was an old English word that meant affection. But we don't speak that way today. What's a better word for 2012? Let's say affection. Let's say I yearn for you. See, that's why you have all these different translations. They're not saying different things. They're trying to get you closer to what is the meaning of the original Greek. Does that make sense? That's very important. I have tender mercies. There you go. That fits. Because the Greek word has all of those connotations. Okay? If I go home to Monique tonight and say, Honey, I just have bowels for you. <laughs> You'll be sleeping in the carport. <laughs> She'll be like, Well, honey, go, 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 go. <clears throat> now. Thank you, Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, do it. You got that magazine? You done with it? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> this class is going, woo, way over here. Uh, turn to this sheet that I gave you. And, and, and the reason I Xerox this out of, did you have a question? I'm sorry. Did you have your hand up? I, I, saw, I thought I saw a hand. Okay. 
This one here that has, okay? Yeah. Look, look, look on the side that has the word bows there. See the word bows, verse 8? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. This is Xerox from a book uh, entitled New Testament Word Studies. Something to that effect. And what it does, it pulls out English words that could have more than one meaning that may throw you. And, and, and let's look at what they say under bows. This verse provides one of the best examples of the fact that a literal translation may actually be an incorrect translation. Paul says that he longs after the Philippians in the bowels of Jesus Christ. The Greek word is splanchanon, or splanchanon, which means bowels. That's why, they, that's why your Bible says it. So it's not like they translate it wrong, or it really means inward parts. But the problem is, in that culture, what that denoted, what that denoted was affections. In our culture, that's not what that denotes. <laughs> You see, let's keep reading. Look what he says. It is it is used literally of these physical organs. And what's great about this book, it gives you a reference. You can look up Acts 118, but elsewhere in the New Testament, 10 times it is employed metaphorically. Now, watch this. This is something that your Bible won't tell you, but this book will tell you and, and be a great help. The Greeks thought of the bowels as the center of affection. But we use the term heart for that. Okay? So the translation bows here is actually misleading. Not only does it convey entirely the wrong idea, but it is apt to start the mind off on a sidetrack of unpleasant thought that will divert the attention away from the true meaning of the passage. No. <laughs> you think? I don't know why Charmin's coming to mind. Right? There. Or a modium. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, where, where were we here? Therefore, any well informed person reading the Bible in public will, <laughs> I like that, will change the word bows to something else like tender mercies. And then he gives you the translations ERV, ASV, or affection. Okay? So. He goes on to talk about another reference, and you've heard this in the Bible, bows of mercy of our God, right? So again, we see where bows was used because in the Greek culture, it meant inward parts of where the affection lies. That's what the Greeks believed. So if we go back 2,000 years and you're a Greek brother and I say, oh, man, I have bows for you. So, oh, man, I have bows for you too. It would have been fine. It would have been fine. We're not in that culture anymore. That's why word studies become very important. Now, please hear me. Don't be intimidated by this. It doesn't mean that every single English word you got to find out what the original was. No. But there's going to be key words in verses that are going to pop out. What this book does, notice after verse 8, you see a verse 9. He just picks one word out of verse 9, the word judgment. Why do you think he picked that word to tell you what the original meaning meant in Greek? It's important. It's important, and it's going to have great implications on the meaning of that entire chapter. So, so he just went through it. You can see verse 4. Verse 5, he pulled out the word fellowship. Verse 6, he pulled out the word perform. He's not going to pick every word. He's going to pick key words. This book, anybody can use. You don't have to know Greek to use this book. The Greek scholar did the work for you. Okay? So again, and, and, and I'll give you a list of resources that if you want to just create a little library for yourself, not this huge library, but two or three books that are going to really help you study the Word of God. This is one of them. <coughs> Make sense? Okay? I'm sorry? What book is this? This is New Testament uh, Word Meanings is the name of the book. I can get to the author and all that for you, all right? But I just wanted to Xerox that to show you that, all right? Um, now, this simple three-step process is called general hermeneutics, which means interpretation or to explain at times called grammatical historical exegesis. Don't let that scare you. What's he saying? What we just did with the word bows. Understand the word in its grammatical historical context. What did that word mean 
in Bible times. That's what these tools will help you to do. Okay? Number two, there is special hermeneutics which does not replace the former but adds other rules to help come to the original meaning. This will be true of poetry and prophecy. And we'll talk about those when we get to step two, which is interpretation. Look at letter B real quick. Whenever a person begins to approach a book, a chapter, or a section, the central theme or subject must be grasped, and this comes only by reading it over and over again until the central theme stands out as the sun illuminating the rest of the material. Very important, guys. And again, nothing wrong with just reading through your Bible. That's great. You will probably get more out of it if you pick a section, a chapter, or a book and just read over that repetitively for a week, for two weeks. Okay? Look at number one. The Gospel of John, central theme is Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. How does he know that? If you read through all the chapters of John, you see that theme. It just keeps coming up. Kind of like what you guys did, and you started to see themes coming out of Philippians. All right? By the time we're done this little exercise with Philippians, you should know what the book of Philippians is about. Why? Because you read it in a commentator? No. Because you read it and you observed what it was saying. Look at the next one. The theme of Romans is the righteousness of God revealed for the salvation of man by grace and faith. How does he know that? Guarantee you, you read through 14 chapters of or 15 chapters of Rome, Romans, you're going to see that theme emerge all the time. Okay? This is the third area of the inductive method. So, now we get into observation, interpretation, and application, which we've already been talking at, but we'll, we'll jump on to that uh, next time. Here's what I would love to challenge you guys to do. Read through Philippians one time, each time you're going to go and study this week. And I would love for you to take chapters 3 and 4 and list observations. Okay? But before you do that, whether it's one time, two times, three times before we meet next time, always read through all four chapters first. And then go and camp out on chapters three and four and just list your observations. Okay? Now, what, what will be helpful, and, and, and maybe you're already doing this, is your observations from chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, if you don't have them all on one page, get them all on one place. If you have different sheets all over the place, get all of them and put them all together, all your observations. Because then you're going to stand back and you're going to do what? Observe your master list. And you're going to see themes just fall right off of the page. Okay? Make sense? So that's your homework for next time. <coughs>